Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. I hope and trust that you are all doing well. Before I get started, I would like to give a very special shout out to the reform members of Back to Ashes. Through scrutiny, Samantha Place, Lisa Radford, Tina Mead, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, Mana Ash, Normie DW, Christy Elias, Cindy Cleveland, and Patty's niece. If you would like to become a member of Back to Ashes, all of that information can be found below in the description. Also, thank you to those who have donated to my GoFundMe. I am still taking donations as it is really hard right now to try to find a place to go, but a head held high always remains positive. If you feel the need or you would like to help, that GoFundMe link is also down in the description box. Thank you in advance. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes, for once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in to get warm, and prepare for this dose of vocal milk melatonin entitled true let's not meet stories right after this intro an ad will play i'll read the first story an ad will play and after that there will be no more ads within this video a few years back before i started dating my fiance i worked at ihop we had a new manager and she was awesome she was almost like a big sister. We had this table of semi-regulars, two guys old enough to be my dad. One started hitting on me and asking my manager about me. At this point, I'd been single for a while, and she told him to ask me out himself. She meant no harm. So, I mean, I guess he was all right, attractive enough for his age. He asked me out to be polite. I said he could just leave his number. I felt uncomfortable but didn't think much of it. The next weekend, they came in and requested my section. I was busy and mostly just went on about my business. He asked me a few times why I never called him and I kept responding that I was busy with my two jobs and a young daughter. The next week, he comes in again and requests my section, asking why I never called. So, I told him once again that I had been busy. I was starting to feel very uncomfortable and ignored him that day until it was time for the check. They paid and I thought I had seen the last of him that day. I went over and started talking to my coworkers. All of a sudden, I feel arms around my waist from behind and before I could react, he's freaking kissing the side of my face, told me he'd see me soon and left me standing in shock. He came in the next weekend and asked to sit in my section once more. I panicked. It's probably worth noting I'm a victim of domestic violence from a previous relationship, which made the situation even worse. I don't like people touching me, especially people I don't know. I told my boss I couldn't take the table and why. He kicked them out and told them to never come back. That creeper flipped me off on the way out. So, you old nasty guy... I hope I never meet you again. So, for a little context, me and my friends have a channel where we explore abandoned places and such. Nothing much happens in the videos. I edit in some scary sounds and stuff like that and call it a day. This happened a few days ago, and it scared me shitless. So there's an abandoned building near our houses. It's four stories high and big. So we said, great, we can film there. So we waited until it was around 8.30 p.m. and headed out to film there. We only bring my camcorder that my dad gave me and walkie-talkies to seem professional. We entered the building and went through numerous rooms on the first floor. Everything went as expected. Rooms with trashed furniture and trash on the floor. We filmed five minutes down there and went on to the second floor of the apartment. The second floor surprisingly was pretty clean. There were some rooms totally empty. We got bored and went to the third floor. That's where shit became real. We heard footsteps in one of the second floor rooms. We first thought it was a friend pranking us or something, and that it hit us like a train. We heard five voices that sounded like grown men. They talked in an unknown language. I think it's Latin, I'm not really sure. 
We were scared shitless and hid in a room and prayed that they wouldn't see us. We were hiding there for a good amount of time, maybe 10 minutes, after deciding to book it and just leave. We headed downstairs and saw a light coming out of one of the rooms that was on the other side of the hallway. We saw a guy in some sort of black cloak come out and scream something at us and started speed walking to us. We spun around and ran out. I had a head start because I'm the fastest in the group. We split up. I didn't dare to look behind me and I just ran. I called one of my friends who was alone and basically crying at this point and told him to just run to my house. We never told anyone about this and never will. From that point forward, we stayed away from that building, never entering it again. So, to the guy in the cloak, thank you for haunting my nightmares, and I hope I don't ever see you again. This happened when I was just about 14 years old. My family ran a summer camp of sorts where we invited kids from Korea and China over to our house in the United States for a few months. We would go on tours of the country, showing them all the landmarks and famous attractions. One of the stops along our tour of the East Coast was the Smithsonian. The day we visited the Smithsonian, I was not feeling too great. The road trip was long. I was packed in the back of my car with a bunch of strangers and had a nosebleed right before we had to step out of the car. Even though the Natural History Museum was my favorite place in the whole country, the combination of feeling sick made me want to get away. After speeding through the exhibits, I went to the bathroom for a bit to calm down. I didn't feel like walking, so I sat down in the rotunda with an elephant on it waiting for my family and guests to finish up their tour. While I was sitting, a short woman sat down next to me on the bench and started touching my shoulders. She began speaking to me in Korean, asking my name, my birthday, and a whole lot of other personal details. I was mostly confused and gave vague, short answers. The whole time, she was rubbing my shoulders and generally acting way too close. When I saw her face, she had a sad expression in her eyes. I didn't feel any malice, but it was still a very weird situation. Over time, I got more and more uncomfortable, and I stared straight at the ground, hoping my parents would hurry up. Eventually, she got up and left, and one of my guests showed up to tell me we were leaving soon. The more I thought about it afterward, the weirder I felt. I had been alone for several minutes by the time she showed up, so it was strange that she already knew I spoke Korean. She also treated me like we were family and left without a word. I don't think I was in any real danger due to being in full view of the crowd and cameras, but it's an unexplained experience that has stuck with me for years. So, little old lady, I hope you found your comfort and we never meet again. I hate getting gas at night. I have learned to avoid it, as I have had some strange encounters that have left me feeling very uncomfortable. But none are as bad as this one. I had just picked my sister up from college, and we got on the highway to get home. Suddenly, my gas light comes on. It was getting dark out. I was kicking myself for not getting gas sooner, but it made me feel safer that I had my sister with me so I get off the highway and pull into the closest gas station I could find. It was completely empty. I had just put the pump in my car when I heard, Hey, sweetheart, you from around here? I jumped. This man had seemed to have appeared out of thin air. He was tall, older, and disheveled. His clothes baggy and twisted. Immediately, I felt uncomfortable, but I didn't want to jump to conclusions or be rude. So I answered with a vague answer. Yeah, kinda. 
He started asking more questions, taking a step closer to me with each question. He was rattling them off so quickly I didn't have time to answer them. The questions were getting more and more personal, and he was getting closer and closer. I was getting increasingly uncomfortable. Then finally, he asked, Are you married? For context, I am 23, but have been told I still look like a teenager. This question obviously took me by surprise. I didn't know how to answer, so I looked away. The man cleared his throat. Miss, I said, excuse me, are you married? Now he was within touching distance of me. It finally clicked what he was doing, trying to see if there was anyone who would look for me if I disappeared. The realization sent shivers down my spine. I shouted at him, Get away from me! Startled, he jumped back and said, You ungrateful, entitled bitch! and kept cursing at me as he walked away. It took me about 30 minutes to stop shaking. Creepy old dude at the gas station? Let's not ever meet again. So to start off, I'm 16. Haven't had a job yet. I really want to work. I need to get out of the house. I got an interview at a Popeye's in my city. I get there around five minutes before my interview. I have really bad social anxiety and struggle to speak in certain situations. By the time it was my turn to be interviewed, my nails had been gnawed off. I was very shaky. I could hear it in my voice. I'd been listening to what the previous girl had said. I like examples of what to say and do. And so I thought I was ready. No masks were worn. Mid-COVID and this man did not put on his mask. Red flag number one. He also was looking towards places where I was trying to maintain eye contact. I had one of the mom cardigans on, so I crossed it over my chest. When I did this, his attention finally fell back on my face, where it should have been. Especially since I am a minor, and he did know that. He bit his lip a lot and would sigh weirdly. It was like a moan. Obviously uncomfortable, I tried to take his attention from me onto some random questions. I started to ask about the restaurant and stuff. He answered very dismissively. In the end, I got the job. I was told an email was going to be sent to me within the next day or two with my login info so I can get started on training. That's an important detail for later. I give it two days and I've noticed nothing. I call and they tell me to call back in the next day at three because he's out of town. I go to high school full time and I don't get out until almost four. By the time I called, he had gone. I called multiple more times to no avail. I called that Saturday and he finally answers. He starts telling me how I was supposed to have stayed after the meeting and get my login information from the assistant manager. That's when I had had enough. I'm already very short-tempered and I had given this man every ounce that I had. Listen, man, I applied there and you said I was hired. You also said I would receive an email with my info. I was not given that or any other way to contact you urgently. Not to mention how unprofessional it is to lie to a new employee. You are an unprofessional man and a creep. I suggest you start focusing more on, excuse me, ma'am, but I know you listen to me. Focus on hiring people and not the chests of obviously underage applicants. I told him to take my file out of their system and to F off. I hung up before he could say another word. Multiple emails were sent afterwards, belittling me and some extremely unprofessional behavior. I blocked the sender's email and still continued to receive more. Multiple calls were made to my own mother by this man. We reported him and he has since been fired. Note to all hiring managers, when you make a mistake, own up to it. 
Don't lie to new employees. We aren't stupid. Warning for the sensitive listeners. This next story involves heavy language, of which I will not censor. Listening discretion is advised. I was a kid at the time, maybe eight or nine years old. My family and I decided to go to Swiss Chalet for dinner. My Canadian friends will know what this is, but for the rest of you, it's a rotisserie chicken restaurant, which was normal for us, so that's not the creepy part. I ended up taking a bathroom break and had to use the only stall in there. When I got inside, nobody else was there, and I was by my lonesome. A few minutes pass and another man enters, older fella, judging from his steps, and I could make out his shoes. They were typical black, boxy-looking dress shoes. As he got inside the bathroom, he was whistling and singing along to the song, playing over the speaker. So far, everything was fine. He went over to one of the two urinals, used it, started washing his hands, and then out of nowhere, he starts swearing profusely, and what felt like was directed at me. Things like, fucking dick, piece of shit, you bastard bitch, etc, etc. Which were, by the way, not part of the song playing overhead. Now, I was a very shy kid, so this kind of thing was awful for me. First of all, I'm in a stall all by myself, which was already scary enough at that age for me. It gets worse if somebody gets inside with me, and then to have this happen is a big no-no. The guy was swearing for what felt like an hour, but was still actually a good like five solid minutes of swearing. I swear. Not to mention, his voice became very, very hoarse all of a sudden, and when he was swearing, he sounded like slightly demonic, but almost like a whisper so as not to let himself be heard by anybody. I couldn't do anything, and I ended up pulling my feet up towards me to try and hide and prevent myself from crying. I felt helpless, and like I was going to get hurt or something worse. Finally, he stopped and left, only to literally come back in for like a second to say one last thing. Fucking prick, eat a bag of shit, or something like that. I stayed in the stall for like a good five to ten extra minutes just to make sure he wouldn't come back. I finished and cleaned up as fast as I could and slowly exited the bathroom. I looked left and right before leaving to check and see if anybody was there and then quickly ran back to my family at the table. I asked my dad if he had entered the bathroom and he quickly replied no. At first, I actually thought it was him based on the shoes, but my dad's were slightly different, more of a brown if anything. I quickly told them what had happened, clearly pretty distressed, and they kind of laughed it off and thought nothing of it. We finished eating and then left. I had a quick glance at the restaurant to see if anything stood out to me, but nothing, or rather no body, stood out to me. Everything seemed normal. We left the restaurant, and it's safe to say I was very scared about going into a bathroom alone again for a good year after that. Thankfully, something like that has never happened again. So I work in a restaurant. One night we were short-staffed, and I had to help on the floor. So the waitresses were just me and a young girl called Anna and our manager, David. Anna was 18 and an absolute knockout. On this cold, dreary Monday night, she still looked like a movie star. It wasn't too busy, so we were going okay. Towards the end of the evening, there were only a couple of tables left, all in my section, so when the last table came in, He was put in Anna's section. This guy was a real hipster. He had a giant beard with a little braid in it. He ordered his meal and pulled out his own bottle of sriracha sauce, 
He had swallows tattooed on both hands. As Anna took his drink order, I shot her a look as if to say, have fun with that guy. About 40 minutes later, Anna had gone for a smoke, so I asked Hipster Dude if he wanted anything else. Yeah, how about your friend's number? I laughed him off and he ordered a refill on his Pepsi. A little while later, Anna comes into the kitchen to find me. She told me that Hipster Dude had asked what time she got off work. She told him she could go when we closed. He told her he would wait for her shift to finish. She said no thank you. Hipster Dude then said, Well, these Pepsis are unlimited, so it doesn't look like you will be getting rid of me anytime soon. As Anna explained all of this, she looked very unsettled. I asked if she wanted to leave. She said no because her housemates wouldn't be back until late and she had forgotten her door key. So I found David, the manager, told him what had happened. He uselessly said he would keep an eye on things. I told the chefs that after Anna's shift, they were both going to walk her to her car. They agreed. Hipster dude left around 10 minutes later. The night finally crawled to an end, and Anna waited for the chefs to finish so that they could walk her to her car. I got changed and went over to the hotel next door to the restaurant because I needed to pick up some paperwork. As I crossed the car park, I noticed this van. It was black, with rust on the side panels. It had blacked out windows. The headlights and engine were on. As I got to the other side of the van, I saw a hand hanging out of the window holding a cigarette. A hand with a swallow tattoo. I walked calmly towards the hotel and then sprinted around the building to the back entrance of the restaurant. I found Anna and the chefs just getting ready to leave. He's still here. He is outside waiting in some creepy murder van. Don't go out there, I panted. Upon reflection, these probably weren't the right words to have used. Every one of us was panicking by now, save for Dave who was in the office. So we came up with a plan. Anna would stay inside, by the door with one of the chefs. Me and the other chef would go out to the car park. I would drive Anna's car right up to the door, and she would get in and drive with one of the chefs back to her house. The chefs lived near her anyway. The plan went off without a hitch, except for the fact that as soon as Anna's car pulled away, so did the creepy van. I start calling the chef in Anna's car frantically. He is following, I said. He was, said the chef, but he just turned off. He isn't behind us now. Relieved, I walked over to the hotel and spent about 20 minutes sorting out order forms and other paperwork, helped David lock up, and then walked to my own car. In the inky blackness of our restaurant car park late at night, I heard the crunching of the gravel underfoot. Then, when I got to my car and stopped walking, the footsteps didn't stop. I heard crunch, 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 and then a whisper. Why couldn't you just let me have her? I leapt into my car, locked the doors, and sped away. To the creepy guy in that black van, I hope you get caught, and I don't ever want to see you again. So, this happened about 15 minutes ago. Here's some backstory. As of four months ago, my wife and I live in a certain metropolitan city of the southern east coast of the U.S. We will just call it our city. She has been a native all of her life, and I a native 500 kilometers north. We have eaten out downtown for special occasions, like our six-month anniversary a few months ago. One of these restaurants is a fancy Thai one we tried on a whim. And it was amazing. I run a small catering business that cooks specifically to teenagers with stage 2 outpatient anorexia and their parents. It's a tiny niche I'm proud of, and the backstory behind that is relatively odd. So, on to the meat and potatoes. 
Now, this weekend, I'm up in Philadelphia by myself, attending my cousin's wedding, as my wife had to cancel at the last minute. All went well. Plenty of drinking, dancing, and pizza the size of my head. I walk into Penn Station just now and go to get a sandwich to eat on the train. I sit down and am about to unwrap it when a guy comes up to me. He's five foot nine, maybe 90 pounds soaking wet, and has the stereotypical shaped head with beard. He gives me the impression of a generic traveler and something I can't quite figure out, giving me creepy vibes all around. A messenger bag over his shoulder, he asks, you're going to our city? To which I'm caught off guard and answer in the affirmative. This was my first mistake. He asks about my work and I tell him short answers in an effort to get him to get bored with me. Nothing seems to work. He really wants to get to know me. Keep in mind I don't have any friends or acquaintances who are like this, any family members who have this personality, and I've never met this man in my life, as far as I can tell. Finally, he asks if I like cooking and I say yes. I tell him about my business and he asks if I've ever been to restaurant. I answered him. Yes, it was amazing. The wife and I went there a few months ago. This was my second mistake. Now, I get excited talking about food with anyone, whether it's cooking or eating or dreaming about food designs, flavors, or the ways in which good food and teas can be medicine and help you feel wonderful after a long day or relax you when you can't sleep, or get you ready for the day, or slow time for enjoyment during a break. I ended up getting worked up for a good 15 minutes just talking. Looking back, it seemed like he was reading my body language and reactions, while nervously looking around the station as if trying to see who else was listening. When he says, You don't remember me. We met at restaurant. I squint as he says this in confusion, because it was only myself and my wife that night. I'm thinking that maybe it was our server, but how would the server remember me months later in a different city? He stops me to tell me this, and I realize that even though we've been chatting for this long, I still feel sick talking to him. He comments that the food scene in our city has been up and coming. He tells me his name four times slowly and parses out the syllables. He looks over at the police officers walking around and says in a low tone and a smirk, Good to meet you. He then walks towards the food court and tells back, I'll see you on the train. Now, there's nothing on my clothing or bag that indicates that I lived in our city or work there. All of my things still have the logos of my previous jobs or places I've volunteered at. As I walk onto the platform, I'm trying to hide from him. I really don't think I want this guy to be sitting next to me for the next 10 plus hours. I don't even know if he's on the train now, and I hope to not find out. He possibly could be a con artist and all around, just a creepy dude. I hope to never meet him again. I was about 19 and still in college at the time. I've always had a hard time studying at my house, so I would usually go to a coffee shop in the evening or late at night to study. Around that time, I would just go to the McDonald's near my house, grab a burger and study in one of the booths since it was closer and I didn't want to drive to the city. This day, I was sitting in the booth closest to the bathroom when an older man walks by probably in his 70s, on his way to the bathroom. He stops to look at me and tells me that he loves my hair. I thank him and go back to studying, but he was still standing there. He continues, My mother used to have chestnut-colored hair like that. She was beautiful. I'm trying not to be rude, so I respond with something generic and go back to work. He then sits down at my table uninvited. He begins talking to me about his daughter who is likely about my age. 
He goes on and on about how he likes to visit her and play his music for her. He pulls out his phone and tells me he's going to show me a video of her. While I'm not thrilled that he's sitting with me, he seemed harmless and maybe a little lonely, so I just let him enjoy some company. He pulls up the video and shows it to me. To my horror, it's shaky footage of a girl that was likely in her 20s, laying in a hospital bed in what appeared to be in a vegetative state, with her mouth gaping wide open, while he, I assume, was talking and singing to her in the background. He then breaks it to me that she is in a coma. I don't even remember what I said to that exactly, but I think I expressed how sorry I was that she was in that condition and tried to call my boyfriend who was meeting me there after work. It was about 11 p.m. now and the man is still sitting at my table, oversharing details about his life with me while I clearly am now weirded out and trying to ignore him. He then gets up and I watch him walk out the front doors to a large white van. The man opens the side door and from what I can tell, he had been living in the van. The glimpse I got of inside showed me a lot of cluttered belongings such as clothes, bedding, boxes, etc. He crawled in and I thought he was gone for good. I go back to studying for my big math test. I hear the front doors open again and look up. It's him. He walks directly back to my table and hands me a business card. He tells me to remember to vote for him for president and that he's out campaigning. Then, eventually, goes back out to his van and takes off. The card just had his name and for president written on it with a cheesy slogan. Needless to say, after that and a couple run-ins with a homeless man, I stopped studying at McDonald's to the presidential candidate living out of his van. Let's not ever meet again. I'm going to start my story off by apologizing if it seems kind of jumbled. I'm still a little creeped out by this. This was about two years ago. I work at a hair salon in a restaurant to open up next to our store. The food was good, and we would stop by there for lunch once in a while. Well, every now and then, the dishwasher would come out from the back of the restaurant to watch us. Didn't bother us, he just watched us. He always seemed kind of creepy to me from the get-go. Wore a big, clear apron around himself. Imagine a raincoat type of thing. Man, just looked grimy. Hair unkempt, dirty mustache, really old. One day, I went in by myself and was short on cash to get some extra chicken for my burrito. So, I opted to not get it and take my food and go back to the salon. All of a sudden, one of the other employees comes in the back and gives me a thing of chicken. The dishwasher guy came in and said he wanted you to have this. Um, great. I was kind of confused by this as the guy seemed strange. I didn't eat that chicken. Well, one day I'm walking back to my car and notice the cops around. Someone had gotten arrested in the parking lot. So I kind of take my time getting into my car. Well, who walks up to me but the dishwasher guy. He tries to strike up a conversation with me. How are you? How was work? Why are the cops here? I made my answers quick. Here's the kicker. Hey, Are you seeing someone? I reply, yes, I am in a relationship with my boyfriend. I quickly say goodnight and get in my car and leave. Figured it was the end, but nope. This is how our meetings went. He tried to talk to me. I'd get in my car. He made sure to take the trash out the same time I did. I used to acknowledge him, wave once or twice, try to be nice. But it got so repetitive... He tried to watch me in the restaurant, like purposefully walk out of the back. I didn't go as often, or would have someone else pick up my food. The big joke in the salon was that he was my creepy boyfriend. We all joked about it. We all knew he put me on edge, but he hadn't done anything bad as of yet. 
so I just started ignoring him. We would joke about him. Well, the dishwasher got even stranger. He started watching me work from the salon window after he would take out the trash, just standing there. Thank God I have a male employee to walk me to my car at this point. And when that didn't work, I'd go to the coffee shop next door and have one of them walk me to my car. I was starting to get anxious about running into this guy because I would randomly run into him. Dishwasher guy came in one day when I was off and seemed disappointed, but he got a haircut from one of the other stylists. Big joke I got returning to work was he was getting cleaned up for me. Um, no thanks. Well, the restaurant wasn't doing well at this point, and the guy just spends his days watching me. The day before their restaurant closes, permanently, might I add, dishwasher guy comes into the salon, freaking out that he needs to talk to me. My coworker basically tells me to get lost. She's busy. After that happened, the restaurant closed down, and I never saw the guy again. So to the dishwasher guy... I hope I never see you staring into my salon ever again. My girlfriend and I took some time out to do some backpacking and travel the world. We went to some incredible places and met interesting people, but our most interesting story is probably this one. As I said above... We went all over, Myanmar, Bolivia, Mexico, many places that have some unsafe reputations. However, we are both pretty good at reading people and staying out of trouble, so we never had any major incidents. We were on a fairly tight budget at this point in our journey, as we had recently been to Japan and wanted to chill for a bit before finding some work in Vietnam. We decided to volunteer on a Cambodian island. Ko Rong Sam Lom. It's a bit of a luxury island full of resorts that we couldn't normally afford to stay at, so it seemed like a good gig. I worked behind the bar at this resort, and my girlfriend worked in the restaurant. In return, we got to sleep in the dorm, and our own meals were free. The manager told me that since I was working behind the bar and am Scottish, An English guy who lived on the island would likely come see me, and that his name was Dog. It didn't take long for this to take place. A fairly old guy in his late 50s, maybe early 60s, came into the bar. He was quite tall and still powerfully built, and was accompanied by a massive Rottweiler, which he quickly told me was also called Dog. We had a bit of a laugh, taking the piss out of each other. He was making fun of me being Scottish, and I was making fun of him going by the name Dog and being English, standard British bullshit. I noticed he was always wearing wife beaters, which said Dog's Offshore Bar, and had a picture of his dog, the Rottweiler, on it. I got to know more about Dog, the man. He used to work in construction and offshore, as did I, so we had quite a bit in common to talk about and heaps of opportunity to talk as he usually arrived for his first beer at 7 a.m. He was clearly an alcoholic, but he never struck me as a bad person early on, just a sadly complicated old man, like when you talk to someone who's homeless. Anyone who's ever been to Vietnam, Thailand, or Cambodia, or any Southeast Asian country will understand how rare it is to see a dog that's not some kind of street mutt or tiny pet. Dog's huge dog would stand out even in Europe, however. Even for a Rottweiler, he was huge, massively muscular, with a metal chain to give some semblance of control if it was to kick off. I really liked dogs, so I was quite interested in what this huge dog was doing on the island and always made sure to have some water out for him. He was friendly enough, but never left his owner's side and seemed to be a working dog in terms of its intensity. It was clearly a guard dog. It turned out the dog was actually a Finnish drug dealer's dog and that dog, the person, had bought him. He told me the dog had an attack command, and he kept him primed by using it often on other island dogs. 
He told me it had killed multiple dogs this way. I didn't believe this at first, but there was an island dog the manager would often leave food out for, and this dog would never come near the bar, usually when dogs, monster dog, wasn't about. But that night, he must have been hungry enough to brave it, and dog hissed the command and the Rottweiler bounded for the island dog, knocking over chairs and all sorts until he was called off. It was pretty damn scary. One night, I was sat at the bar talking with Dog about this job I would be taking on soon at a digital marketing company. I was in talks with the CEO at this company at the time. It was for a digital marketing job in which I could work from home or coffee shops updating and improving websites. He said it sounded made up and that the company was likely some kind of con to get my bank details. I told him it was a real company and that I had googled it. He was really drunk at this point, and the restaurant was now closed, so my girlfriend joined us, and we were all having a beer at the bar. He told my girlfriend how I believed everything I read online, and how I shouldn't do that. He said people publish all kinds of made-up shit on there, and I asked what he was referring to, and he said, Don't ever Google me. So I was like, How could I Google you? Your name is Dog. If I googled you, I would just see a picture of some lashing. But then I remembered those tops he wore. Dog's offshore bar, so I told him, I am going to google you, while I laughed at him. He was getting quite annoyed, but at this point, other than owning a weaponized canine, I thought he was pretty harmless. I was wrong. I began reading out loud the interesting things I found out about his bar and related stories. One of particular interest was about a conviction. The joking and laughing stopped, and I quickly stopped reading out loud. I looked quickly to my girlfriend, and I could see the smile leave her face as she realized we were drinking with a killer. It turned out this guy had murdered his Thai wife and then been briefly imprisoned before paying bail. You can pay bail for murder in Thailand. And then fleeing the country before trial. He had stabbed her, and his alibi to the police was that he couldn't have killed her because he was banging a ladyboy on the beach at the time. He told us that he had been framed, and that his wife's ex was in the police, and he had killed her for moving on, etc., etc. I was nodding along to everything he said, and trying my best to show that I agreed with him whilst making sure the machete I used to open up coconuts for cocktails was an easy reach, should his beast be given any command words. He told us about how hard it was being one of the few white guys in Thai prison, how he had to attack guards to get into solitary confinement, and then they beat him mercilessly. He told us they used to leave Shanks in his room and put him in the yard with pedophiles for him to kill. He told us that he had killed people before he went to prison and that he killed while he was inside. But he did not kill his wife. His wife was a Thai prostitute he met while trafficking women from Thailand to Singapore on his boat. The same one he used to flee Thailand after his arrest and set up his bar, Dog's Offshore Bar, With the tagline, Dogs Welcome, Wives Must Be Kept on Leashes or Under Control. We both acted like we believed him and eventually he left. The whole night, however, I was waiting next to the door for him and his dog to come for us. I even propped a bin up against the door so anyone coming in would knock it over so we would maybe have a chance to react. I nearly attacked my friend when he came in. was pretty messed up. We quickly decided to leave after this and only saw Dog again once more. My girlfriend was opening a can of coconut milk for a curry and he came by and jokingly asked if she needed a knife and he patted his back pocket. The guy is known as Mick the Palm or Mick the Dog if you want to Google this. If you Google Dog's offshore bar, you'll see what I did. He was living in a tent on the island with his dog keeping watch while he slept. I'm not sure if he's still there now, but Doug, let's not ever meet again.
I was driving a rental car at 3 a.m. Just my friend Theo, the name has changed of course, and I heading home at the end of a busy road trip. We were on a twisting two-lane road, the kind with no streetlights, the kind that weaves through the mountains. We wanted to make it back before dawn, but a few hours from home, exhaustion hit us. Bleary-eyed, desperately trying to stay awake, we looked ahead for some place we could stop at or anywhere with lights. There was almost no signal on our phones to search for options, so we were relieved to finally see a distant gas station through the trees up ahead. It had been the only building and lights we could have seen for miles. As I drove towards it, I saw a blur and realized I'd just passed someone. A man walking a few paces off to the side beside the road, just at the edge of the woods. My brief glimpse had shown him in dark clothes, something long resting on his shoulder. Huh? Theo said. I made some hmm sound of acknowledgement. We'd both seen it. Weird, but we weren't concerned. We were too exhausted to care. And then we were both very frustrated when the gas station turned out to be a small medical clinic, long ago converted from a gas station. They'd kept the typical awning above where the gas pumps would be, and the lights were on outside, but the office was dark. We eased down the narrow gravel drive and paused in front of the building anyways, trying to get enough signal on our phones to look for a hotel or somewhere safe to nap. Signal was still spotty, so we were resorting to paper maps. Neither one of us felt great about this spot, even if it was a little island of light in the dark area. This was when the man showed up in my rearview mirror, continuing to walk along, keeping at the edge of the pool of light. I had an immediate bad feeling and started the engine. No lights, just the engine. Didn't want to blind some poor guy trying to get somewhere if that's all he was. He passed us by. I saw his back and realized he was carrying a flag on his shoulder, wrapped with cord. I couldn't quite make out the type of flag. It looked like it might be a U.S. flag, but it didn't look quite right. The bars were too thick and not quite enough, and I couldn't see if the stars were there at all. Hard to tell in the dark and with the flag curled up. His clothing looked odd too, like some strange combination of a military surplus store, but I'd seen odd clothing on drifters before. He just passed on, kept walking into the dark, out of the light, out of sight. I told myself he was just a local walking home from some hole-in-the-wall bar or a homeless man heading to the next town. I told myself the exhaustion was getting to me, making me paranoid. We looked at the map for some time, cursing our bad signal, and finally we had figured out a route to what looked like a nearest large town to get either a hotel room or just a safe parking lot to nap in. We got ready to go. I told Theo he could put his seat back to nap. I had a second wind, so we would make it. Theo sighed in relief and put his seat back. I was pretty sure he fell asleep in seconds. I tried my phone again, watching the signal flicker in and out, then sighed and checked the paper map once more. Ready to go, I turned on the high beams to check on the narrow road that led us out of this lot, and my adrenaline shot up. Best energy drink I could have. The man hadn't walked on. He had stood there in the dark, and now my bright lit him up facing us now. Dark clothes, dark military-style boots, dark complexion, and a huge smile. That smile raised the hair on the back of my neck. It seemed all sorts of off to me. He was staring at the car, just grinning, and he was blocking the little road in front of us out of the little lot. I waited. If this guy wanted to mess with me, he'd have to come closer. He had waited a good distance away. I could wait for him to move. I checked behind me, gauging if I could quickly back up, but it had been a weird turn into the place, a gravel road, plus several concrete poles to move in between, 
and it would not be a speedy path in reverse. I didn't know this car well, and I was not confident I could reverse without getting into an accident. I glanced at my sleeping friend. Then the guy was suddenly in front of our car. I'm still not sure how he could have done that in what must have been only a few seconds while I was looking away. I can only blame it on exhaustion, how he suddenly just was there, light shining on his white teeth and his huge wide grin. I must have made a noise because my friend woke up and sat up. What the hell? He managed, and the guy just stared at us, just grinning at us through the headlights, standing right in front of my car, just grinning. Mm, it's some crazy guy, I murmured. We had both lived in big cities. We dealt with crazy types before. If they weren't armed, usually they were nothing to worry about. I saw no weapon. I was wary, but not scared. Then I noticed a heavy-looking point at the end of his flagpole, still resting against his shoulder, and the mental image of him spearing it into my windshield, or just down into the hood of my car, was suddenly vivid. I had no idea what was going on, but I did not want to give this middle-of-the-night crazy person a reason to attack the car, and I knew I couldn't reverse quickly to get us out of there. I waited, mentally willing the grinning nutcase to walk on with his weird flag and clothes. I have no idea how long he stood there, just staring at us and grinning. After what seemed like a long moment, he began moving, but moving against the car, sliding to the side, slowly coming around to one side, but dragging himself against the side of the car as he moved. The car shifted slightly with the weight, and I could hear the slide of cloth and the drag of the wooden flagpole on the side of the car. A small, ridiculous part of my brain congratulated me on buying the insurance for the rental car. I'm pretty sure he was scratching it all to hell. The grinning man gripped the driver's side mirror as if using it for a support and leaned down. I saw a glimpse of that grin through my side window and looked away. I suddenly did not want to look at that freakish smile when it was only inches away from my face. Just a little glass between us. Theo leaned over slightly, looking through the window. I saw my friend shake his head. No, he said firmly. No. I saw the grinning man make a hand gesture, and Theo said louder, more forcefully. No. The man straightened, no longer leaning on the car. I saw his fist grip the pole, and I gunned it out of there. And he just stood there. The dark figure just stayed in that pool of light as I shot out into the dark road. No longer sleepy at all. We had no problem staying awake to the next town, where we found a motel. Crazy flag-carrying man? Let's not ever meet again. My parents had purchased a condo about 10 minutes from their home, around the time my older brother was born, with the intention that my siblings and I have the option of renting it when we come of age. I moved in alongside my brother a few weeks after my 18th birthday, exhilarated by the freedom of our childhood home, which had become laden with traumatic memories over the years. The move took two or three days, and we had a U-Haul coming in and out of the driveway during that time. My first day of college occurred a few days later. I had a full schedule, three days a week, which I would later regret, with my last class getting out at 6 p.m. The city I live in is notorious for heavy traffic, and I would not get home until roughly an hour and a half later, despite the university being less than 15 miles away. The sun was mostly down by the time I turned into my street, and there were a few people, some occupied and one alone taking their evening strolls. There was nothing remarkable about it. 
The driveway was occupied, so I parked on the street and made my way home. The following day, I got off my closing shift at 9 p.m. It was dark by the time I got home, and there was a man walking on the strip of sidewalk that faces the condo. I would not have noticed that he was the lone man from the evening before, if it was not for him wearing the same outfit, a bright yellow hoodie, black nylon track pants with white pinstripes, gray Nike trainers, and a tan baseball cap. As I got out of my car, we shared a quick glance and continued on our ways. Two days later, I got off my closing shift and picked up my, now ex, boyfriend up for a date. We went back to the condo so that I could change, and in the dark, I saw the man again, wearing the same outfit and on the same strip of sidewalk. It's him again. I sounded more surprised than sussed out, and my boyfriend was confused. I explained that I had been seeing him walking around and that he was always wearing the same thing. We got out of the car and stared at him. Our bodies turned toward him. He ducked behind a car. Now properly sussed out, we got back into my car and watched him get into his and drive away with his lights off. It was too dark and he was too far away for us to catch a license plate. At this point, I was not sure if this man even lived in the neighborhood. We went about our night and I dropped my boyfriend back off at his parents' house. He told me to call him and or the police if I saw the man again and I agreed. I got home around midnight. The man was a street away from his usual spot, crouching below a tree and hugging his knees under his chin. I drove past him and noticed a different man in a blue flannel and jeans approaching a streetlight. He got under the illuminating glow and pulled his phone out, attempting to make a call. I wasn't sure if the two men had any association with each other, until I looked back over at the yellow hoodie man. He was no longer under the tree. He was also under a street light, a few meters away from the tree. His back was turned to me, but it appeared as though he was taking a call. As I looked back and forth between the two men, it became pretty obvious that they were communicating with each other. I drove away and called the police. They told me to stay where I was or go to another safe location and that they would contact me when the matter was taken care of. I dozed off and was awoken maybe an hour later by the promised phone call. I was told that neither of the two men were residents of the area and that they were simply told not to come back on reports of suspicious activity. After being advised to call again if they came back, I went home. I was tired enough that I had no trouble sleeping for a little while. Around 4 a.m., I was sharply roused by the metal screen door rattling against its frame. The force slowly grew in intensity, and eventually, the walls and floor were quaking. I peeked through the blinds of my second-story window, which overlooks the front door, and of course, I saw the man in the yellow hoodie aggressively attempting to open the screen door. I was shaking in my boots on my mattress, which was still on the floor as I had not yet purchased a bed frame. I received a call from my equally bewildered brother who was in his room. I told him to call my dad while I called the police. It has now been almost four years, and I can assure you all that my street smarts have markedly improved. So... To the man in the yellow hoodie, I hope we never ever meet again. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true let's not meet stories. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves. I'll read to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or good night. Peace, love, and light to you all.